you never fail, you never have, you never will. Jesus, you never fail, your promise stands forever. started in Habakkuk. I always feel very Hebrew when you say that. <laughs> Habakkuk 2, 1 through 3. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it for still the vision await awaits its appointment appointed time it hastens to the end it will not lie if it seems slow wait for it it will surely come it will not delay second reading is first timothy 3:14 through 16 
verse 14. I hope to come to see you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. We'll finish in Acts. We will follow the navigations of Paul here. And hopefully I'll be able to navigate these pronunciations of these regions. Verse 9 <clears throat> in chapter 18. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Acacia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see it, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. After this, Paul stayed many days longer, and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Centria he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Acacia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. God bless the reading of the scripture. Amen. Thank you, Ben. Follow along with me in the Bible, especially as we get to our last point here today. In this Acts chapter 18, I just want to touch on a couple of other things and then pray. In the earliest part of Acts there is where Paul had met Aquila and Priscilla. And the Bible said they met because they were of the same trade or craft. And they became great friends. In fact, Aquila and Priscilla became just pillars in the church and great helpers to Paul over the time frame that had passed there. And we also have Silas and Timothy in verse 5 who had stayed at Macedonia when Paul had come over to 
Corinth, and and he was there basically to save his life because they were trying to kill him in all those places. And then a Paul, apparently, he was talking to the Jews and they just would not respond, they would not respond, they would not respond. So he took his coat, he shook it off, and he said, I am blameless of you and your blood be upon you and your heads. I am innocent from now on. I'm going to the Gentiles. Apparently, in Paul's mind, he was going to leave there and go someplace else. But the Lord stood with him, and that's where 9 and 10 comes in and says, Don't be afraid, Paul. Nobody's going to hurt you here. Stay here. I have many people in this city. Keep speaking. Keep talking. And apparently in that, it, it refueled him. The next verse says that he stayed on there for a year and a half, and many, many people came to the Lord. In fact, there were at least 35,000 uh, believers when Paul wrote back that First Corinthians letter to them. And he said, when you're all gathered in one place, and a lot of times we just think there's just 5, 10, 20, 100 people or something. So this, this is the beginning to the mid part of Paul's travels and we're going to look at something today then if you look at your last verse there in that chapter it says and Apollos we aren't talking about Paul now and Apollos attended to pass up into Achaia and that is where Corinth was to the brothers there and so the disciples welcomed them sent a letter with him and when he arrived there he greatly helped those who believed through grace he greatly helped. Everybody say greatly helped. So I want to talk to you along the idea of learning to help other people believe and being an overcomer yourself. Every song we sang this morning, every word that we've heard, the prayers that we've heard have been all about overcoming. The tone of this service is that we are overcomers, okay? God does that and he prepares us and he plants us, uh, those kind of things in us because there's a battle before us it, it is there. It is real. If you heard this morning in the devotional about the tale of the three boats uh, we talked about there. Um, yeah, this year, I mean, obviously, this election year, uh, if Mr. So-and-so does get into office, H is going to break out like you've never seen before. And this, if he doesn't get in, H is going to break out like you've never seen before in this nation. It's just, you don't have to be a Christian or a prophet. You just need to have some feelers out. What does that mean? That just means that there's turbulence ahead and God is preparing us for these days. And nothing to be afraid of. God is always with us. It seems like sometimes he's not, but he is always there. If you're in our psalm class on Wednesday nights, we've been talking about it. And sometimes it seems, and God's even brought judgment to people. Like when he put... Israel over in Babylon for 70 years, he basically destroyed and divorced them, wouldn't have anything to do with them. And so Daniel would always go to God and say, your people, your people. And God's like, they're not my people, they're your people. <clears throat> and anyway, so Daniel's like, when he prays, it's your people, it's your people. And God is moved for the heart of his people, no matter what their conditions, understand that and understand that clearly. It seems like, and that's where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's where Daniel aligns in, that's where the greatest stories are. When God supposedly had left them, he had left them in one sense and judgment was there, but in another sense, God is always there. He's always moved in the heart of his people. He loves his people. He's going to work with his people until Christ returns again. Let us pray. Father, today, in the name of Jesus, we just ask you one more time, if you would be with us in this word. We thank you, Lord, for this book of Acts and the words that we've heard from this pulpit over the Last days, weeks, and months, we do pray, Lord, that today and the days, weeks, and months that are ahead of us, Lord, that the word of God will just stir something in us to make us overcomers, overcomers, that word that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. So I'm going to end up, Lord willing, in this First Timothy chapter 3, and I changed the, some of the verses around just because um, I as I was looking at it, I was just saying, I need a passage of scripture that just says this so clearly. And my eyes fell upon that. And actually, Ray Gates and I have been talking about this for a lot of years. And uh, Lord willing, today we're going to at least uh, 
do a proposal of doing the best we can in that passage, and you'll see that in a moment. We did read it a few minutes ago. But to be overcomers, to be of good cheer, to be a people who are not overcome by the circumstances of life, but we overcome them. Sometimes you hear people saying, well, how are you doing? Well, under the circumstances, I'm okay. Well, God has never called us to live under the circumstances. He's always called us to live in the circumstances, through the circumstances, and above the circumstances. Whatever life is, God always brings us. And, and uh, yes, there's always those tones. I heard it so good here this morning. So I'm going to go kind of quickly here through our first parts, but we're going to end up with this guy by the name of Apollos. Uh, first of all, Paul, his group, always had an uh, ongoing purpose in life. And we talked about how this purpose had changed from time to time. For example, Paul was here, he was going to speak, and in Paul's mind, those people would not receive Jesus. Now, here's what's so amazing about this, in case I forget to tell you later. Paul spoke to these Jews, they resisted, rejected, they didn't want anything to uh, listen to what he said at all. He was gonna leave, apparently, because God said, stay there, he was apparently afraid because God said, do not be afraid. He apparently wasn't going to talk to the people anymore. He says, don't close your mouth, open your mouth, right? So, so God stirred him. He stayed there. He left. And then Apollos comes there. And when Apollos comes there, things just take off amazingly. So was Paul out of the will of God? Was it? No, sometimes there's people, there's moods, there's change, there's times. God, there's times when people will accept things and times when people won't. Uh, and God knows all of that. And sometimes you've got to plant the seed. You've got to get some things thinking in people before they'll actually receive it and all that kind of thing. So he had an ongoing purpose. His purpose never changed, though. His purpose was to go and to bring this gospel to every possible place. And in Paul's mind, he took on the whole world, okay? There's people... Philippines, we chant, you know, one guy's over in Haiti here, one guy's over in Africa, you're good. Paul's like, no, we're going to take on the whole world, okay? This guy was a world changer, he was a world thinker, and he wanted to make a difference, so he did not want to waste his time with people who did not want to receive it, and that was Paul's mission, that's why he was there. And so he had this ongoing purpose, and so we see that as he went from place to place, and people were uh, different. He tried to go one place, Holy Spirit said no, tried to go to another another no and then they picked up Luke along the way that was God bigger, bigger purpose he didn't say that but he would go from one city to another to tell other people about Jesus this ongoing purpose that he had to the Jew first so he would always go to the synagogues and talk to them and then typically they would reject it and he would go to the Gentiles. It didn't always go that way. For example, it says in this passage that we read in Ephesus, the Jews there were very, they were very prominent. They were listening to the message. They even said, Paul, will you stay here? And apparently he had made a vow and he had to get back to Jerusalem for whatever reason, so he didn't stay. But he did come back and Ephesus became a great center for the church in those days. And then... We see that Paul reached out to people, mainly to people who never heard. So Paul did not want to work with people who had heard the gospel before. He wanted to go to people who have never heard the gospel before, okay? Now, we have people who are missionaries, and they, they just live for, I want to talk to people about God. I want to see people get saved. That's that evangelism part in us, and it's you're kind of two kind of, people I found in the scriptures. One is that you want to nurture, you want to help, you want to minister, you want to help people, you want to equip them, you want to be teachers, you want to help them and bless them along. And then there's other people, they want to get in people's faces, they want to go to the abortion clinics, they want to get down where the action is, and they want to tell people about Jesus. Which one is right, which, which one is wrong? Both of them. Everybody say we're on the same side. <laughs> we're on the same side. But Paul was that driver, and he wanted to see things happen. He had a, just a call from God to go to people who never heard the gospel before. In fact, he had to be told by the Lord a couple of times to stay there and work with those people because he was on to the next mission in his own mind. Even though his purpose changed 
tweaked a little bit by the Holy Spirit. His place where he would go, his purpose was ongoing. I want to encourage you this morning, let's keep the main thing the main thing and not get caught down with the details of things that go on, right? Everybody has issues. Every church has issues. Everybody has problems. We all know that. However, we don't focus on all of that. We focus on the goodness of God. We praise the goodness of God. And I commend you this morning for singing those songs all about God, all about Jesus, all about overcoming. Secondly, to help to be good, to learn to be of good cheer, to help other people in their faith. Secondly, you have to have ministry partners. Everybody say ministry partners. Okay, so we're a church, we're a body. We understand that it takes everybody to work. It takes everybody to help and to have your part. Some people it's finance, some people it's prayer, some people it's fasting, some people it's teaching, some people it's in serving in different areas. Some people want to be out in the public. Some people want... God needs us all, amen? So Paul met these people, and that's uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and so there was also Timothy, there was also Luke, there was also Silas that aren't in this particular chapter, but nevertheless, there were partners that Paul had. In fact, do you know how many partners are listed in the Bible that Paul had? There's over 100 that were here, his personal partners and associates in the gospel. We think about Paul. I personally think, and you see just little waves of this tail every once in a while. Paul wasn't alone, and those guys who are with him, they're not even listed here. But even if your name isn't listed, even if you don't make it in the newspaper every week about the good things you do for the Lord, guess what? God's still watching, and he knows who you are. And so we have to understand that. So who, th these people aren't even in it. They were in the last chapter. They'll be in coming chapters. So he meets Aquila and Priscilla here. How does he meet them? In the same craft. When you have the same thoughts, the same ideas, it opens the doors for people. In fact, I was at a gun show one time, and a guy says, hey, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. And he said, you know why I come to these gun shows? <laughs> and I go to gun shows because it's just peace for my mind but um, he, and I said no why <laughs> he wants to tell me and he said because all these people like guns I like guns and when I'm with people and it's just like what is he saying what is his heart saying there we find a common interest and when you find a common interest it brings you together okay we have a motorcycle outreach a lady just sent us a uh, paper you can look at on the desk back there in the welcome center uh, from I, I used to ride motorcycle when I was a kid I used to live on it I never rode one for 35 years or some, some crazy thing and now we have this big bikers I have had zero to do with that but you know what people who like to do that we can come together and now this year we're going to add a car show to it you know why I got an old truck because I'm going to polish that old truck we're going to get some other old trucks last year we had some guys in there they brought some old cars here they never went to church they never that wasn't a part of who they were we're up there praying some of those pictures of us praying we had a prayer meeting going on they're eating fish they're all happy and they they're saying well I guess that's what Christians do over there is get together and pray why are we doing that because it's common interest ladies and gentlemen and when you find a common Common interest, it opens the doors in a greater way to reach more people for the gospel. There's one guy that I worked with out on the reservation for years. He came here. He wouldn't talk to me. He wouldn't look at me. He'd come to the tent meetings. He would not go in the tents. He'd stay outside. He'd not, and, and next year he comes and he stands on the outside. Next year he stands in. Next year he's in. Now he comes to me and he said, will you pray over me when you pray over my bike? I met him down at Farm and Fleet in Rice Lake. I talked, talked to him for, he talked to me for about a our just wanted to and I'm here to tell you folks when you find a thread of common interest you can use that to the glory of God and to extend the kingdom of God and to let the purpose that's in you find a place okay I didn't see value in fact when I repented of everything else I repented I got rid of my motorcycles and snowmobiles and cars and trucks and everything else I went to Bible college and in my mind here's my keys I'm a mess I need to get fixed I need God to help me and God did help me and in the process of time he brought it all back somebody say amen to that so 
we have what we call ministry partners. And so in children's church and jail outreach and praying at the altars, we're good individually, but we're better together. And so we just have that uh, when, when, when we do that and when, uh, and when we have people and we pray for people at the altar, if you're moved in your heart, yeah, pray, join with us and be partners. We want to be side by side serving the Lord. Can you say that with me? Side by side serving the Lord. What will that do? That will help us to increase and encourage the faith of other people. Next. In my mind, I'm still on the introduction here. It's the church of Antioch. Now, we need to see something about the Apostle Paul. And I'm not saying what I'm going to say because I feel like somebody has issues here, but I just want to make this real clear to people where I'm at, where we are as a local church. We believe in the local church, okay? We believe in elders. We believe in a pastor. We believe in gathering together. We believe, one of the guys, he, one guy came and he says, we, he says, we don't need a place to meet. And he says, he said in China, he said, they don't even tell them where to meet they, and what time to meet, I said, that'll never work here in America. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, we have a hard enough time. Here's where you meet. Here's when you meet. And people still don't get it here. So anyway, I said, that's not going to work for us. I'm sorry. And his idea is he doesn't like a local church. Okay. And then, and, and then one lady came up to me. We had beautiful flowers and the um, sign box there. And she came up and she said, oh, how disgusting are those flowers? They look so nice. I'm like, what's your problem? <laughs> And she says, you're taking God's money. She didn't even know somebody else pays for that anyway. She said, you're taking God's money, but I let her rattle. Somebody said, let her rattle. And so um, she said, you're taking God's good money and you're putting them into flowers rather than into souls. And I said, ma'am, I have an idea for you. I said, don't brush your teeth anymore and don't buy any more toothpaste. She says, what are you talking about? I said, if you think that's a waste of money. Anyway, <laughs> the, here's the deal. We're physical, we're spiritual, and we're social beings, okay? There's nothing wrong with things. There's nothing wrong with stuff. You look in the Old Testament, every place they went, they brought them and they brought their possessions with them wherever they went. God protected them and their possessions. Possessions aren't, fun, are, aren't worth anything. Then why did Paul make a, excuse me, David make a statute in Israel that after the people go into war, they come back and the people who stood right there and, and, and this old Bible says, stayed with the stuff, stayed with the material goods. They were just as important and he, he said, there's not a statue in the Bible. I'm going to put a statue in the Bible from here on. Whoever stays with the stuff and protects the material goods is just as important as those who go into the battle. Why is, is that? Because we get off balanced in our mind and we have to understand that everything is vital in the Lord. There is no waste. It's okay to put new roofs on. It's okay to continue to build. It's okay to put pretty flowers. It's okay to mow the lawn. Somebody say amen to that. Because we're spirit, soul, and body and local church, and we have that. And local churches is where we need to be and what we need to do. Why do you say that? Because Paul went back for the third time, he went back to his local church. So he went, he was in Corinth, he was now all the way over into Europe, he worked his way back through the boats, he stopped by the place at Ephesus, he goes back, he goes to St. Uh, Caesarea, and then he goes up, says, hey, to the brothers up in Jerusalem, and he goes right back to his home church. What are you saying? I'm saying for authentic ministry, you need to have a local church. You need to be under the covering of a pastor and elders. You need to be blessed by a congregation of people. Somebody say amen to that. That's just wholesome. That's just Wheaties. That's just oatmeal. That's just meat and potatoes. That's just the way it works. And so Paul had this. So if you want to really make a difference in people's lives, you will be a part of a local church, and that's right. So that particular church was Antioch. Remember the church at Jerusalem? They just couldn't get it in gear, and so God apparently raised up that church. In fact, nobody ever talked to anybody who was not a Jewish person before, but at Antioch, they started bringing in the Gentiles, and it became the center for over 800 years. It was the center church for sending out missionaries to the rest of the world. They were a missions-minded assembly. So we had a missions report. We have a missions conference. We believe in missions. That's part of who we are. That needs to come right out of the local church. And 
Barnabas, we see, is added here to Paul, and it became, a, this Antioch church was a home base for Paul and Silas and Barnabas, and so we need to have a home church, and he goes back there every single time. So Paul, as a model Christian here, worked with, went back to his, and, and Paul could hear from God. Paul could go out and start churches, many, many churches, but he still connected back home with his local fellowship every single time before he went out again. That's my long introduction in my mind, but actually it's very valid points. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, renewing our vision. So there are times when you have to have your vision renewed. We've seen it here in different places. Paul comes to this place. Paul apparently is tired of working with these people. Uh, and and um, he... We are introduced to this man by the name of Apollos. Everybody say Apollos. So who wrote the book of Hebrews? Personally, I think Apollos wrote it, but he didn't want to put his name on it because Apollos is a Greek name. It's a Greek goddess name, actually. And so he didn't want to say that, so he just says the writer of the book of Hebrews. A lot of people think it's Paul. doesn't say your guess is as good as mine. But Apollos, the Bible tells us a few things about him. He was mighty in the scriptures. Everybody say mighty in the scriptures. Amen. You're going to need to know to read your Bible, folks. Amen? You're going to need to learn to read your Bible at home. I'm going to do a fairly good job in communicating a lot of, I'm going to talk about it, a lot of what we believe isn't just what we hear from the pastor or what the, what the bylaws say in the churches, but it's usually what we sing. It's usually what we sing is end up what we believe. That's why we sing biblical songs here, right? And people get mad at me when I say it, so I love to say it. Um, <laughs> How can you turn somebody else's song? Because they didn't do it right. They didn't quite have it right with the Bible. They're close, and it's a beautiful song, but it's not quite scriptural, okay? And so we, we fix songs like that. Do we fix all of them? No, we do our very best. But the bottom line is there, we just want to sing. We just want to live in line with the Bible, right? That we're a Bible-believing church. We're a, people say, are you a word church? Yes. Are you a Baptist church? Yes, because we baptize. Are you a Catholic church? Yes, we're a Catholic church because we're part of the whole universe. That means, are we a Lutheran church? Yes, we believe in the tendency. Well, who are you? We're anything that's good, anything that's right, anything we celebrate at somebody's, if it's in the Bible. That's why we are Bible-believing people. The Bible said this man, Apollos, was mighty in the scriptures. He was powerful. And, and there are people who are gifted people. Uh, we have some friends, I have some friends, and they're so good at taking the Bible. He'll take something I'll spend 12 hours putting together. He'll talk to me on the phone for two to three minutes. He'll take that message that I give him. And he'll take that message and he'll speak that message and do a better job in communicating that message than I do who put all the work in it. Why? That's a gift from God, folks. Some people have it. Some people have to go down to the storehouse and dig. Amen? It doesn't matter. What about salesmen who are out there? People who sell cars. They're not in the factory. They don't put cars in. They're not thinking. They're just good at, at, at selling the product. And so those are gifts from God. And, Cor, and this man by the name of Apollos, he was strong and mighty in the scriptures. Not only was he mighty in the scriptures, but he was also fervent in the spirit. What does that mean, fervent in the spirit? He, it just ate him up. It was in him. It just was passion in him. Do you have a passion for anything? Is there anything you want to do? You want to stir that passion up inside you. God puts a passion in every man, woman, and child on this planet to do something great. There was a guy by the name of Chrysler. They thought he kind of lost his mind, so they put him in a room. And today we have Chrysler cars, Chrysler vans, Chrysler Dodge. Everything else came because one guy, they couldn't figure out who he was, what, why he was there. And he created an automobile, and Chrysler products are still going strong today. Somebody say amen to that. Because God puts a burning inside of you. Thomas Edison was a person who saw a light bulb years before there was a light bulb. They said they took over 900 different elements and they didn't work. In fact, he said one time they, they were putting grass and sticks and different kinds of metal and trying to 
get something to go between these two polar caps like in every light bulb here, unless it's LED, it's another thing, but, but the light bulb, but he saw it burning before it was burning. He even re reached over to one of his partners who had a beard and he pulled out one of his whiskers and he wrapped that around there and he put the light to it and it burned it up and he said, well, we know another one that doesn't work, but we're going to find, and then they found that, that piece of carbon that they finally put across it and, and, and it worked and it stayed on. Why? Because he had something burning inside of him. It's a passion from Almighty God. Before he saw, before there was a light bulb, it was burning inside Thomas Edison. And we were at his place a few years ago. Uh, Billy took us there and Billy and Graham, Billy. And, and uh, while we were there, and um, we went to his place in his library and this guy invented the phonograph. And then they said he was blind. I'm sorry, he was deaf. And I'm like, how do you come up with a phonograph? And they said, see those little marks right there in this original thing? That's his teeth. He put his teeth on there because he couldn't hear good. And he listened to the vibrations with his teeth. And something was burning in him. Now, that's an intelligent man. That's a gifted man. That's a passion man. You don't have to have all the stuff together. You don't have to have all the things. You don't have to be a good hearer to come up for other people to hear music. You have to have it burning in you. There was a man in Tupelo, Mississippi. And there was something burning down in his breast. And he was 16 years old. And he tried to play his guitar and sing. And they said, you're terrible. Go drive a truck. But he had something beating down in his soul. He took the gospel out of his home. He took the rhythmic blues or the blues and he put them together. And that's what we call today rock and roll music, rhythmic blues. His name was Elvis Presley. He had something pounding in his soul, a new song. Do you have something inside of you? This man, Apollos, was not just good in the scriptures. He was pulsating in Jesus and the Bible says that he was so passionate he was so passionate about communicating Jesus to other people that it encouraged everybody else who were believers you have some passion in you you have some life in you that goes beyond what you have now this same man the Bible said everything he spoke on he was accurate but he did not know the ways of the Lord perfectly. He had the message of John the Baptist. He never heard about Jesus. He never heard about the cross. He never heard about the, he heard one was coming. And he was still speaking on that. But he was, he was making a difference with that half of gospel message. Everybody say full gospel. It's a little different now. When I first came to town, they said, for your full gospel, what does that make us? Quarter gospel churches, half gospel churches. You're supposed to be the full gospel church. I just say, sir, I don't know who you are. I just know who we are. Amen? We're full gospel. What does that mean? That means that we believe in the full measure of what God says. We believe there is a Jesus. There is a Holy Spirit. He does want to come to us. He does want to fill every person. He does love everybody. And when you get more of the Holy Spirit, amen, and you're supposed to have, you'll do things that you could never do in your own. And so Aquila and Priscilla, the tent makers, the friends that Paul had made back, they heard this man, Apollos, speak. And after the service, they said, come talk to us. And he says, you, you, everything that you say is right, but you're missing a few things. Jesus did come. He did die on the cross. The Holy Spirit now is available to every believer. And so he's, and they, the Bible said they spoke the word of God more accurately. They showed him how to do it better. Here's the point. We need to be correctable. Okay? We had a friend uh, years ago. He stood up and he said, the pastor is going to be saying some things to us here in the church. And we're not going to want to receive it, but we need to open our heart. God is telling us that we really need to hear this. So I went and I talked to this brother. I said, brother, I said, thank you for sharing that. I said, I've had something on my heart. I just wanted to communicate with you. And so um, I said, would, would, it, here's just the area I think you could do a little bit better in. Oh, he got so mad. He got so offended. He left the church. And it's like, God was saying that. 
God was saying that to him, but he was projecting it out on everybody else, and God was telling him he was hearing right. It's like the old drunk guy. He would go and get drunk. He would stand up and he would prophesy and weep and say, you need to turn to the Lord. And it was like, okay, yes, somebody needs to turn to the Lord, but it's not everybody else. It's you. We need to be correctable. Everybody say correctable. Okay, nobody likes to be corrected. Nobody likes to say that what you're doing isn't good. We don't like that, okay? We don't like it. I've had it happen to me multiple times. I've had it happen from the Lord. One time I'm driving down the road, everybody, uh, I was just having a hard time in my life. Uh, people just had different ideas than I have. I'll just put it that way. And um, they didn't like my preaching. They didn't like my teaching. They didn't like this and they didn't like that. And I'm driving a van, church van. I had to come back and get some stuff at a youth camp. And I'm riding, I'm driving out of Hayward. I'm heading back and I'm going. And the Lord started to talk to me. And he said, I come to church too. And he got my attention. And he said, I like what you're teaching. I'm listening to your messages. And he said, I like your family. Man, I pulled over the, I started weeping and crying. I had to pull the truck off to the side of the road. And God just helped me and encouraged me because you can hear something. If you're corrected, it's always for good. If you're spoken to by the Lord, it's always to help you. And sometimes the Bible even says discipline. There's little babies, young people, everybody go, you can't do it. Let me do it. You know what that's for? Sometimes little kids need a whack on the bottom. That's not child abuse. That's not child abuse. That's not child abuse. It's a well-padded place where people need to get a whack once in a while. Why? Because you're disciplining children. You can't let children just go do what they want to do. You've got to get there. Do they like it? No. Do they like it afterwards? Yes. You've got to be confronted, right? Anyway, you get the idea. So what did, what did Apollos do? Apollos said, thank you. He said, thank you so loud. He said, I'm going to go over to Corinth where Paul was. And the Bible said he went there. And when he said, they said, we're going to write you letters. And they wrote letters. And they said, hey, listen to this guy. He's got a message. And those same people, listen to this now, those same people that Paul was trying to get to the Lord, the Bible said they were great. He greatly helped those who believed in grace. So here's this guy full of passion. He's better now than there ever was. And the Bible said it did make a difference. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of First Timothy chapter 3. I want to look at this. I'm going to do it fairly quickly. Not that I couldn't do a whole message on it, but I'm going to do it as a conclusion today. And then we're going to break bread together here in just a few minutes. First Timothy. This happens to be uh, Ephesus. So when you read First and Second Timothy, it always has directly to do with Ephesus. Timothy was the pastor at Ephesus after things got rolling and Paul went back out on the road. And he talks to them about um, the church being the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth without question. Great is the mystery. Everybody say great is the mystery. There are many mysteries. What kind of mysteries are there? There are mysteries of creation. There's mysteries of, uh, of marriage. There's mysteries of the Jews and the Gentiles. These are in the scriptures. There's mysteries of how every Jew is going to come to the Lord. Jesus, all Israel shall be saved. Paul said there's a mystery of Jesus going back and saving Israel, how that whole thing is going to happen. It's a mystery. There's a mystery of the body of Christ. There's a mystery of the resurrection of the body. Paul says, I talked to you about a mystery. This is the mystery of godliness. This is the mystery of how this whole thing works together. Now, in this passage, I want you to look at verse 16. John 3.16, this is 1 Timothy 3.16. John 3.16, this is, and here's what it says. Without great question or controversy, great is a mystery of godliness, of Christ. And then he says six statements. Now, these six statements apparently 
came from a hymn, hymnal at the time that the early church sang. It was, saying, it was a song that was sung by the early church about Jesus. And when you look at the words, it looks very much like the words of a song. In fact, some of your Bible might even have this, these verses a little bit off to the side or indented or something like that. Just to explain, there's a quotation that Paul is writing. It's kind of like, how great thou art. You can take the, uh, by the way, a sermon, a, a, a hymn is a sermon put to print. It's sung then, that's what a hymn is. And so this is part of a hymn that the early church sang. And here's what they said. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached on by the Gentiles, and believed on in the world and taken up into glory. What we see what Apollos did is he focused on Jesus. And I'll say this now, lest I forget to say it later, and that is we need to exalt Jesus. Paul said we don't preach ourselves, okay? If all of our chickens came home, there wouldn't be anybody in this building and nobody would ever do anything for the Lord. Do you understand that? We are broken, flawed, sinful human beings. Everybody. I was on the federal grand jury in this state for the western side of Wisconsin. I've seen the worst possible cases that there are in this state. And if somebody can do it, anybody can do it. We are flawed people. We need to be saved. Here's what they did. They took the Savior, they put it into songs, and they made these statements. First of all, he said, God was manifest in the flesh. We just passed Christmas time, the incarnate Christ, the gift of the world. Christ, he grew in the womb. He was graced by his parents and through the incarnate, he was reduced to a single cell in Mary's womb. God became that life of God inside of that womb. And at age 12, he was witness to the doctors of the law at age 12 said, we've never even heard any questions or anybody even talk about the Bible like you're talking about the Bible. And then he went to the cross and he was God manifest in the flesh. That's the manifestation. Secondly, it says he was justified in the spirit. What does that mean, justified in the spirit? It has to do with who Jesus was. It's very clear that Jesus came from a virgin. Can I hear a man? It's what the Old Testament said. Some of the writers, they said, no, it was a young woman. And you go into Revised Standard, some of those Bibles, it even says a, a young woman conceived. Okay, there's nothing, there's, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't have accolades over a young woman having a, being pregnant, to be straight. But you can if she's a virgin. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus lived a virtuous life. He never sinned. And now they have these, these people who keep stats on everything. Well, there's only 60% of your church that even believe in the Bible. 30% of them don't believe. It's half of them believe Jesus sinned. Look, Jesus never sinned. How many can raise your hand and say Jesus never sinned? We believe that stuff. I, in fact, I had to quit reading it because it messed up my focus think everybody's a crook and a villain and doesn't believe anything. There are the people of God, and that's the group I'm headed for. He was justified. He was virgin birth. He overcame every sin in life. And then when he died and he took our sins, he did not die for himself. He did not die for his own sins. And that's what the difference of him as a high priest and everybody else, all of the other priests in the world, including me, including you, we still need a vicarious death to take our sins away. But Jesus said, you are justified in sinless birth. You're justified in a sinless life. You are justified in your death. And that's why what Jesus had no sin in him, you can call on him as a sinner and you can say, Jesus, I need you. I'm taking what you took on the cross, all your righteousness, all your victory, all your holiness. I'm taking that into myself. I'm turning that around. I'm giving you all my junk and crud and sin. Somebody say, that's a good deal. Justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels. That means the angels watched over him. They announced his coming long before he came. They foretold the details of his conception. They they, the angels, again, the angels sang and rejoiced. Remember in the fields of, Gal of Bethlehem when they were there, uh, his, spoke to his parents. Uh, 
one came to Joseph, one came to Mary, talked to him about angels, saw them. They, when Jesus ascended to heaven at his resurrection, there were angels in the tomb, right? Talking to everybody. Angels were, they were watching Jesus. He was observed, observation. Every place he went, when he went down to hell and took the keys away from the devil, the angels were there at the resurrections. They were there. And when Jesus ascended to the right hand of heaven, the angels came and said, angels were watching this whole thing. Amen? Amen. Then he was preached on into the Gentiles. Before Jesus, there was only the children of Abraham. And so if, and I've been there to Israel, they had places where women had to be kind of down the stairs and over there. Gentile men, you're over there. You're back in this room. You can't go any farther. Regular people, you can come this. And if you're a certain priest, you can come here. If you're a group of the priest, you can stand up here. If you're the high priest, you go into the Holy of Holies and they put a rope around his leg, the history says, in case he had sin in his heart because you're going to die in the presence of God. Who's going to go back there and get him? Everybody's going to die. And they had to jerk him out. They said, and that's not in the Bible, but that's what history says. And the point is, Jesus was preached to the Gentiles and now all of us can come to the Lord. He went beyond all restrictions and all bloodlines, above all distinctions, all money, all media, all gifts, all powers, and he reached. Pretty soon you're going to think that includes me. He broke and he threw off all restraints of every other person who was the hardest hearts, the, the ones who had the greatest sin barriers, the people with the greatest excuses, broke through it, through the Gentiles. And he blessed people because he loved every single person. See, there's a bunch of dumbos in the Old Testament that couldn't, couldn't get in there, right? And so he said, I'm going to make this real easy for you. All you have to do is believe, okay? You don't have to do anything else, but you do. Do you suppose you can do that? Maybe you're not going to get past there. Maybe you're not going to get, maybe heathens couldn't even go into the temple at all. They had to stay outside the gate. God opened it up and the Bible says there was an earthquake and uh, the Holy of Holies was ripped open. It wasn't ripped open just so God could come out, but it was to let us in to the presence of God. That's what they sang. He was preached on to the Gentiles. He was, it says he was believed on in the world. Somebody is going to believe about Jesus. Somebody's going to be an overcomer. Somebody are going to be those people who love the Lord. Somebody's going to say yes to Jesus. Somebody's going to yield to the Spirit. Somebody's going to put the yoke of God upon him. My yoke is easy and my burdens light, young and old. And when the Bible says, believe and ye shall receive, somebody is going to believe that. How many believers do we have this morning? Say amen. We're believers in the Lord. They sung this as a song. And then it says he was received up into glory, which is the ascension. And so then the angels are standing by and they say, how about his work on earth? Check. Good there. How about his word? Was every prophecy fulfilled about Jesus? Check. He was there. Did he hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant? You've done. Check. You got it. Every wish and every person where you want just to have eternal life and check, you've got it. Your will was set firmly on heaven from the time you came here to the time you check, he made it. Did you wait your full time to come? The Bible says in the fullness of time, God sent his son into the world made of woman, made under the law to redeem those who were under the law. There was a time, check. Jesus did it all right, folks. What is our job? Believe in him. So there's something about when you exalt Jesus, it helps other people. Sometimes, can you get into everybody's situation, everybody's problems, everybody's hurts, everybody's wounds, everybody's oozies and ozzies, and oh, you, don't, you need to hear what happened to me when I was 12 and 13 and 16 and 19 and 23, and, and then we just, it, we, we start counseling centers, we put more money into mental health, into our local societies. We need Jesus. And there's something about when you talk about Jesus and you exalt Jesus, it helps other people. Yes. Passage I'm going to read to this, uh, this morning at our communion was the passage I heard the night I got saved. 
And I remember when I was listening to it, I was rolling my eyes. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. I was. I was, because it wasn't about that message. It wasn't about that preacher. It wasn't, it was God is going to save you tonight, little punky boy. I didn't bring you here for you to roll your eyes. I'm going to save you, you renegade. You're going to come in this way, but you're going to leave a different way, you little rabbi, you. That's what happened to Paul of Tarsus. He's going in. God's like, will you stop? <laughs> Knocked him off his horse, took the sun and just said, just, just blind him. The Bible said he couldn't even see. Three days, couldn't even see. He was so blind. God said to the horse, kick him. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Not about you, Paul. It's time to get your sins forgiven. It's time to get right with God. It's time to encourage other people. It's time to stay, take a stand for the Lord. It's time to live, stop living a passive life. It's get back into it. Well, I had mistakes. Look, we're made of mistakes. We're fixed by mistakes. We overcome by mistakes. Our sins, the Bible, only God can make this promise. All things work together. You're a homo, you're a twisted up individual. I'm going to turn around, I'm going to make that for good. And that, that's what God does. Nobody else can do that. Does that mean I'm going to go do that? No. It just means whatever your issues are, Christ has conquered. Whatever your excuses are, they stand no more. Jesus Christ is alive. He is the Son of God. We put our faith in him and it changes us and it will help other people. Somehow when we talk about Jesus, it just draws people to the Lord. <sighs> Julius Murray, you know him, his... David Cook was there speaking and this guy comes in a wheelbarrow on the outside. He's listening to him and he puts his wheelbarrow down and he comes to the front and he says, I want Jesus. So David Cook says, after the service, he's interpreter, he says, well, what did I say that made you want to find Jesus? I, uh, you know, this seems to be working really good in India and I want to kind of know what, what I said was right. And he said back through the interpreter, he says, sir, I don't know what you said. I don't know what you said about the Bible, but all I know is every time you said the name Jesus, something just gripped inside of me, and I want that Jesus. There's something about it. You lift in that DNA that God has already put inside of you comes alive, and it says, you're made for this. Those the Lord bless you and keep you. The his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you.